Is this your first trip to the dentist? You a little scared? No? Good. I really can't think of anyone that I know who actually enjoys the dentist. Kids, adults, everyone either begrudgingly goes or puts it off, and even the ones that go consistently probably aren't thrilled by it. It's always an uncomfortable watch when anyone in film gets their teeth messed with, too. The most famous, and perhaps best, is the exchange in Marathon Man between Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier over if something is safe or not. Horror goes that way too, and the best example is the Corbin Burnson-led, Brian Usna-directed duology of The Dentist and The Dentist 2. They're fun, schlocky 90s horror flicks, but did you know they were loosely based on a real person? Well, full disclosure here, there are conflicting reports on if it was or wasn't inspired by the true murderer Glennon Engelman. The true story is very interesting, and the movie is an under-discussed late 90s gem, so we're going to take a look at it anyway. With that in mind, always remember to floss as we take a look at what the f really happened to the dentist. Before Lionsgate was a go-to company for releasing horror, action, and other genre movies, Trimark was kind of a big deal for that type of thing. They had a hand in the Leprechaun films, the Warlock movies, Return of the Living Dead 3, and a host of others. They also distributed things for the US market like bringing Peter Jackson's zany gore-fest Dead Alive to American audiences. They also saw the writing on the wall and put out a number of straight-to-video or straight-to-streaming service films with that second part not sounding too far off from what we have today. The Amityville Curse, Sometimes They Come Back Again, and Pinocchio's Revenge were just some of the video store darlings that could be grabbed at Blockbuster or the local mom and pop video store. All these movies suck. Enter Mark Amon, who had been an executive producer on films since the late 80s and helped bring the Leprechaun films to life, for better or for worse. So bad, I'm good. Here's where it gets a little sticky, as it was his idea that brought the dentist to the table, and different sources say that it either was based on the crimes of Glenn and Engelman, or that it was completely unrelated. Originally, horror legend and frequent Usna collaborator Stuart Gordon was tapped to direct, but he ended up with a partial writing credit instead, along with his frequent partner Dennis Paoli and Charles Finch. Finch is known mainly as a producer, but co-wrote today's movie, and was the scribe of the mid-90s Sharon Stone western Bad Girls. Paoli is a minor legend that doesn't get talked about as much as his director partner Gordon. Reanimator, From Beyond, Ghoulies 2, Body Snatchers, and Castle Freak are all under his belt, along with a host of others. Then there's the director, Brian Usna. Usna has been a producer since the late 70s and has helped bring many Stuart Gordon properties to life, but he's been an accomplished director for some time as well. In addition to today's movie, he also helmed Bride of Reanimator, Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, and probably most famously, Society from 1989. Interestingly enough, Corbin Burnson, who plays the titular dentist, starred in a 1993 made-for-TV drama called Beyond Suspicion that is 100% based on the real-life dentist murders. Or, you know, more accurately, the book written about them called Appointment for Murder, Story of the Killing Dentist. But we don't discuss drama here, oh no. So let's take a look at any similarities between the 1996 horror movie The Dentist and the real-life crimes of Mr. Engelman. The movie opens with an artsy scene of Dr. Alan Finestone stuck inside some sort of insane asylum mimicking using his dental tools when he goes into flashback mode. He says he used to have it all, the house, the job, the wife, and we see him a little bit on edge. The IRS is calling him, he's concerned about money, and there's a stain on his shirt that he can't get out. He's overly obsessed with filth and, with a hunch, comes back to find his wife cheating on him with the pool boy before leaving his home. He has a fantasy of killing them caught in the act, but snaps out of it. Well, after looking over both tales, there really isn't much here that's the same. It's almost like Ed Gein being the inspiration for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Glennon Engelman was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1928 as the youngest of four kids to a military family, with his father serving in the U.S. Air Force. He would later enter the military himself through the Air Corps and use that for the GI Bill and graduate from Washington University in St. Louis with a certificate in dentistry. He would be loved by his patients and have a very successful practice in Missouri. That and the fact that he was married, twice in fact, are kind of the only things that tie our villainous dentists together. Finestone goes to his neighbor's house and finds out that the pool boy has a whole harem of neighborhood women that he rotates on. Literally. 
Alan tells the neighbor about a party for his wife and ends up shooting her dog as the first victim. He gets to his office and slowly breaks down while his dental assistants take care of the patients, including three-time Academy Award nominee Mark Ruffalo in one of his earliest roles. The dentist takes a young boy and his mother into one of the rooms for the boy's first dental appointment, and while he seems very sweet and careful at first, he ends up getting distracted and slicing up the young man's mouth. They leave and he moves on to the next patient, where his delusions and insanity force him to take advantage of the young model. Well, they were both dentists and were both a little bit crazy. Dr. Finestone is driven insane by his life falling apart, where Engelman was more than likely a sociopath. He felt his true talent was planning, killing, and disposing of the bodies, and it was the one true thing that made him happy. While Alan's first victim was the neighbor's dog, Engelman's first victim was just four years after he became a dentist. James Stanley Bullock worked for the Union Electric Company of Missouri and was shot dead at 27 years old, only five months after getting married. Alan's staff become suspicious of him, and the local police are searching for who killed the neighbor's dog. Alan, who received a phone call from the IRS earlier in the day, is visited in the office by an agent, but has to reschedule for the next day when Alan is punched by an angry patient. He goes home and gets revenge on his wife on their anniversary by cutting out her tongue and removing all her teeth. He avoids further suspicions from police by saying he doesn't own a gun and claiming he knows nothing of any local disturbances. After the police leave, he kills the Lothario pool boy by setting up a trap involving his wife. With both his at-home problems solved, he heads back to work like nothing has happened. While Alan has an all-female staff, Glennon had a certain way with women. In fact, the first murder I mentioned previously was the new husband to his ex-wife, Edna. They plotted to kill him and collect on his insurance money. On top of that, Engelman was able to convince one of his assistants to let him kill her husband so he could again split the life insurance money with the woman. The second victim of Engelman was a business partner who he first hit with a rock, then pushed down a well, and finally blew up the well with dynamite. The purpose of that kill? You guessed it, to split the life insurance money with the man's wife. The cops figure out that Alan does in fact own a gun and is even an enthusiastic member of a gun club, while Alan disposes of his two dental assistants and the pesky IRS man one at a time. He strangles the first assistant, destroys the IRS agent's mouth with dental tools, and finally puts an air bubble in the brain of his other dental assistant. The kills all happen out of necessity for Alan. The first assistant finds discarded pantyhose left by the woman he assaulted who was put under by gas. The IRS man is blackmailing Alan because of his less than honest tax returns. And the other assistant finds the bodies. Meanwhile, the police find the pool boy and the wife's bodies and rush over to the dental practice office to confront Alan. While the events of the movie are a sad 24 hours of a man losing his grip on reality, and nearly all the killings taking place in one location, the real-life killer dentist was active for much longer. Engelman's murders took place between 1958 and 1980, and while they all revolved around collecting money, or in one case avoiding paying someone that he owed them, they were done with different weapons. He shot victims, bludgeoned them, and even blew up one in a car bomb. While he was suspected of all these slayings, and a few more, police never had enough evidence to charge him with anything concrete. The final patient in the office, a young girl who is just there to get her braces removed, flees when Alan is about to shoot her. A chase in the office commences where the young patient discovers all the carnage left by her dentist, and is able to convince him to let her go by agreeing to brush three times a day and give up all candy. An out of his mind and exasperated Alan flees the police and heads to a college he's teaching dentistry at. Completely insane now, Alan orders his students to remove all of the practice patient's teeth at gunpoint. The police break in and chase Alan into an auditorium where a hallucination of his wife with no teeth forces him to give up where he is and he's put into a mental ward. There he's tortured by his hallucinations, at least until the sequel. There was no over-the-top chase for Engelman, as it was two events that finally led to his arrest and conviction. The first was the car bombing of a victim he was finally directly tied to. He was being sued by Sophie Berea, and instead of paying her, he blew up her car. The police looked at him first, and Glennon's ex-wife finally went to the police to admit everything she knew. He was convicted the same year in 1980 of mail fraud, conspiracy to commit mail fraud, murder, and capital murder while a few of his various accomplices were also convicted and received jail time. Glennon was sentenced to multiple life sentences and died in prison in 1999 from complications due to diabetes. While the dentist may or may not have been inspired by the real-life serial killer known as the Southside Dentist, 
it was probably minimal if anything. So few of the details made it into the film, and it's much pulpier than anything Glenn and Engelman did. Depending on which article you read, it's either completely unrelated or the famed based on a true story angle. Either way, it's interesting to see two very different tales of a deranged dentist. Don't forget to floss.